So last time we stopped on Dalton's Law. Just as a quick review, Dalton's Law is a law that looks at partial pressures of gases. And so we can think of the atmosphere as an entity. And all of the gases that make up the atmosphere then are subsets of that. So we can kind of think of the atmosphere as having as being 100%. And in the scenario we did with the lungs, then the, the value was a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. So what Dalton's law says is when you're looking at this 100%, then it's based upon all the gases that exist within the atmosphere. So the two most common, three most common gases are these. And then we could add carbon monoxide, we could add a bunch of gases that we add. But the reality is you can only get to 100%, okay? You can't have 101%. So all of these gases together make up this pressure. And so what Dalton said was, well, there's a relationship between the amount of pressure created by nitrogen and this pressure, the amount of pressure created by oxygen and this pressure. So what is referred to as partial pressure. And so when we refer to partial pressures, we write P subscript carbon dioxide and P subscript oxygen. So the way this would be read is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the partial pressure of oxygen. So the value they're giving you is a partial pressure. So well, to, to figure out partial pressure, we have to know the relative abundance of the gases in the atmosphere. So the most common gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen, and then oxygen, and then carbon dioxide at less than 1%, and then everything else goes down. And by the way, this value would be at sea level. So as we move away from sea level, toward the top of Mount Everest, then, then this percentage would change. So the way to think about that is the Earth is a centrifuge, because the Earth is spinning on its axis, even though it's more round than that. And, and because the Earth spins, then heavier gases settle to the bottom. Okay, so if that's true, just looking at these three, which is the heaviest gas? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yeah. So if you have two oxygens, two oxygens, and you know it's heavier than oxygen. And then if you remember a periodic table, oxygen is a heavier gas than, heavier than nitrogen. So this is the heaviest gas. So if you go up in the atmosphere, there's less carbon dioxide. In fact, people who go down into caves uh, get themselves in trouble, particularly on cool mornings. Because as you drop down into a cave, all night long, this gas has been settling in the cave. And so in the cave, there'll be a lot more carbon dioxide than oxygen because it's the heaviest gas, right? So, so what happens then is we go out into the atmosphere, the lighter gases become more numerous. And so this is the lightest of these three gases. So even though it's 78% down on the surface of the Earth, as you go up, it's going to increase. And then even lighter gases like hydrogen gas uh, are found in the outer atmosphere. And so as you go up, like you're climbing Mount Everest, one of the reasons why people get in real trouble is because oxygen levels are dropping. Same reason why you're in a plane and then the little things are supposed to come out because you're at 35,000 feet. And so there's much less oxygen. So what they do is they just take this value and take it times 0.78 to get, the, to get the amount of pressure by nitrogen, or take it times 0.21 to get the pressure of oxygen. And so if you look up here, then the partial pressure of, of 105 at the top then is the partial pressure of oxygen in this particular example, which wouldn't be at sea level. So at sea level in an ideal world, it would be 160. But, but this, is, this example is is a little different. So the pressure of a gas is just going to affect the diffusion rate. So if, which of these gases would have the fastest diffusion rate just based upon concentration? The nitrogen, right? Because it's the highest concentration. So the interesting thing is, is that if you just looked at diffusion, then when we would breathe in and out, we would 
be exchanging a lot of nitrogen compared to, to oxygen or carbon dioxide. So it was actually Henry that gave some insight into that. And what Henry said was that when, we, when you were looking at a biological system where the media in which the gas is being carried is a liquid water, then we have to look at how soluble the gas is in a liquid. Okay. And so what he did is he assigned uh, a value, which is called a solubility coefficient, uh, to the different gases. And so, so here are the solubility coefficients. Carbon dioxide is 0.57, oxygen is 0 0.024, and nitrogen is 0 0.012. Now, what you have to remember about a solubility coefficient is the larger the number, the more soluble. So which gas is the most soluble? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, right. And then, then oxygen is next, and then nitrogen is even less, is half as soluble as oxygen. So what we essentially do when we pulmonary ventilate is we bring in air that's a mix of gases. It gets exposed to the surface of the alveoli, and it has to diffuse into the liquid in the surface to get into the blood. So to be able to, dis di to diffuse into the liquid, it has to be soluble. So it has to go from a gaseous form to a dissolved gas in solution. And so even though we're breathing in nitrogen as the most common gas, it's, it's not soluble. And so we breathe nitrogen in, breathe nitrogen out, it never enters our blood. And then oxygen is the next soluble gas, so, so it's the one that enters our blood more readily. Now, if you want to put that into context, if you like to scuba dive or skin dive, and you fill a tank with a gas, and you go underwater, and what happens is you can change the solubility of gas if you can change the pressure of the gas. So the solubility coefficient is a constant. It doesn't change. So if you want to make a gas more soluble, you put it under pressure. So. Carbon dioxide is our most soluble gas, but at room pressure, it's not real soluble. So if you're making pop, what you do is you put the fluid under pressure, and you can put more carbon dioxide into the liquid. And then when you open the cap to a pop bottle, you release the pressure, and the gas becomes less soluble, and bubbles out of solution. So if you're looking at beer, you're looking at champagne, you're looking at soda pop, the, the why they effervesce, why they bubble is that you, you have carbon dioxide dissolved in solution under pressure. And as long as you maintain that pressure, it stays in solution. But if you change that pressure, then it comes out of solution. So if you shake a pop can up and then open it, what happens? And then it comes out of solution more rapidly. <laughs> yeah. So then if you did that with it being really cold or really hot, it would be different as well. So when we're looking at, at solubility, then the two things that we have to keep in mind is that it's the partial pressure of the gas. In relationship to its solubility coefficient. Okay. And then the take home message is that the reason why we can live on Earth is that oxygen is more soluble than nitrogen, so that we don't load our blood with nitrogen. If we go skin diving, what happens is we begin to load our blood with nitrogen. And as long as we're at a given depth and the pressure's not changing, that's not an issue, although long term. It can. That's why divers can't stay underwater indefinitely. But if you come up too fast, it's like opening the pop bottle. And the nitrogen, instead of diffusing out of your lungs as you're breathing in and out, will bubble out a solution in your blood. And if you come up way too fast. And that's what the bends is when you, when you dive, is the nitrogen coming out of solution. So then they went back to put you in a pressure chamber 
put you back under pressure and slowly release the pressure. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So if we were going to carry a gas as a dissolved gas, which gas would be the easiest to carry based on solubility? The most soluble gas, which would be CO2. That's why we have to have hemoglobin to carry oxygen. oxygen is that it's not as soluble. Which leads us to the next piece we want to look at, and that is hemoglobin itself. So we could not live on Earth without hemoglobin, unless we were a single cell or single cell organism in a pond. So to become a multicellular organism and to exit in an aquatic environment, then hemoglobin was critically important. Uh, simply because we can only diffuse glasses through the surface in our lungs. But if you're a single celled organism in a pond, you're diffusing the, the oxygen in your entire surface area. And it's just a surface to volume phenomenon again. So the fascinating thing about, about hemoglobin is it, it attracts oxygen. But there are things that affect how readily oxygen and hemoglobin will interact. And so one of the things we have to think about clinically and one of the things we have to understand in that relationship is what are the things that promote the attachment of oxygen to hemoglobin? And then what are the things that promote the, the oxygen to coming free or dissociating from hemoglobin? So if we put that in context, then we do external respiration and internal respiration. And in external respiration, we want to attach the oxygen to hemoglobin. And in internal respiration, we want the oxygen to come off of hemoglobin. So essentially, with the two types of respiration we do, we want to make it at one environment more attractive between hemoglobin and oxygen and during external respiration. And then during internal respiration, we want to make it less attractive. So what we're going to talk about is the things that will affect the ability of oxygen and hemoglobin to uh, exit connect is the pH of the blood. And then we can talk about what that effect is how we use it effectively to benefit our exchange of oxygen uh, in those two environments. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So the amount of carbon dioxide we have in our blood impacts the amount of oxygen we carry. And so we use that effectively in those two environments too. Blood temperature. So normally we think of dissipating heat through our skin surface. But if you put your hand in front of your mouth and blow so the air is warm. And that's because we dissipate heat in our lungs, in the air that we breathe out. So our lungs actually help cool us down as well. So what happens in muscles that are actively respiring, they build heat in muscles, they build heat in blood and warm the blood. That's why we shiver when we get cold, but our lungs to help us cool that blood. So what we were going to see is that we have to make a slight shift in blood temperature between external respiration and internal respiration to accomplish the exchange of oxygen. And then the last one is a chemical compound that red blood cells make, which is 2,5-bis-phosphoglycerin. BPP, BPG, and we're not going to talk about that one much but because it's a standard, it's a common thing that doesn't really affect, you don't see many changes clinically. So what we're going to do is look at the things that clinically become important. So before I do that, what we're going to do is we're going to, in looking at these, is we're going to use what's called a saturation curve. And so this is actually a graph of the partial pressure of O2 getting higher as we go this way. 
And, and this is the percent saturation of hemoglobin. So to, just to think about it, and we're going to do this in more detail in the next unit, hemoglobin has got four protein molecules that make it up. So it's a, it's a complex protein made of four molecules. Each molecule has an iron, and each iron can carry a molecular O2 or an O2. So each hemoglobin can carry four O2. So when we're looking at percent saturation, then if you have a hemoglobin molecule and it's carrying three oxygen, then it's only 75% saturated. If you have a hemoglobin molecule that's only carrying two oxygen, then it's 50% saturated. So that's how we're looking at saturation, is the, the capacity, your total capacity to carry oxygen. And, and so what happens is, if we were looking at the capillary bed in deoxygenated blood uh, and contracting skeletal muscle, then in internal respiration, our goal is to give up oxygen from our hemoglobin and transfer it to our muscle cells where it can enter mitochondria and help us make ATP, right? So in internal respiration, our goal is to actually desaturate and so if you if you look at that, because the oxygen is being used up by the mitochondria and we're making water out of the oxygen, then our partial pressure of oxygen in our blood drops way down and the hemoglobin gives up its oxygen quickly so it reaches a point where it's only about 35% saturated. So coming out of really active muscle, we've we've managed to actually exchange a lot of oxygen off of the blood. So we go to the other extreme, which would be oxygenated uh, arteries and systemic arteries. So anytime we use the word systemic, we're looking at, uh, we're actually looking at arteries on the left side of the heart. So these would be the arteries like the aorta, where the blood has been through the lungs. And in our lungs is where we do external respiration, right? And so what we would anticipate then is that we would want, uh, that we would have quite a bit of oxygen in the alveolar air spaces. So we could have a partial pressure of 100 in our alveolar air spaces. Because we have a high partial pressure, then what we're gonna do is to uh, try to almost completely saturate our, our blood. But, but really about 98% is, is usually as bad as good as we get in terms of total saturation. So when you have patients in a hospital that are got respiratory problems, then you do O2 cells. Then you're trying to figure out, you know, what the level of saturation of that hemoglobin is. Okay. And if your your if your O2 levels drop, you become lethargic, you become tired, you get sleepy, there's all patterns. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how blood pH affects the ability to achieve this at, at your lungs and to achieve this in your tissues. All right. So we can think of this line as being external respiration and this line of being internal respiration and to, and to guide your thought process. So blood pH is not very varied, right? So we really, in, in human physiology, we really like to maintain our blood pH at what it says is normal blood pH. So we really like to keep our blood pH at 7.45, roughly. That would be the standard blood pH that we can keep. So what happens if the blood becomes more acidic, slightly more acidic, and what happens if the blood becomes slightly more basic? So 7.6 would be slightly more basic, and 7.2 would be slightly more acidic, right? So the difference in these curves tells you percent saturation, right? So which curve has the greatest saturation? So the curve that's the most steep 
and goes highest to the top of the drip. So high blood pH is, is where we can find saturation at a higher level. And if our blood becomes too acidic, we aren't able to saturate right, as well. So one of the keys to, to high blood pH is you can't oxygenate yourself. Right? And so the important thing to understand about that principle is something about carbon dioxide interacting with water. So, so if we have an aqueous environment like the plasma of our blood, as an example, and we add carbon dioxide to it, and the carbon dioxide is a product of cellular respiration, then what happens is, as we add carbon dioxide to the water, then we form a weak acid, which is carbonic acid. And as we form carbonic acid, it dissociates and gives up hydrogen ions plus a bicarbonate ion. Okay. So the basic thing is the more carbon dioxide I can add to water, the more acidic the solution is going to be. Okay. Now, in any chemical kinetics, reactions are not a one-way reaction, but react most reactions are reversible. And in our body, we have enzymes that help with that process. But if you're just looking at kinetics without enzymes that catalyze a reaction, then if you add reactants, so if I add carbon dioxide because it's a reactant, then I'm going to drive the chemical reaction in this direction just because of concentration, the effect of concentration. So the inverse thought then is true that if I remove a reactant, then I'm going to reverse the direction, the equation, the chemical reaction wants to go. So if I, so, so I'll make this a little clearer. So if I increase the amount of carbon dioxide in my system, I'm going to end up with more carbonic acid, more hydrogen ions, and the net effect is I'm going to become more acidic. Okay. So the inverse is true in this system, where if I decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the solution, I'm actually going to, as a reactant, I'm going to reverse the reaction. And in that effect, the blood is going to become more basic. Okay. So the reaction can reverse itself. So if we think of external and internal respiration in terms of uh, what we're talking about with respiration, and then we add to that the idea of cellular respiration, then where do I add carbon dioxide to my blood? In my body. Why do I have a respiratory system to breathe out carbon dioxide? Because I'm making it from cellular respiration. So in internal respiration, Um, this would be on my tissues. As long as I'm doing cellular respiration, my mitochondria are making six carbon dioxide per glucose molecule. And then those cells are transferring the carbon dioxide to my blood so I can carry it to my lungs. So on my tissues, my blood is becoming more acidic. Look what happens when my blood becomes more acidic. Oxygen doesn't want to associate with hemoglobin. So because I make my blood more acidic in my tissues, I free oxygen off of my hemoglobin. Isn't that a clever mechanism? 
where you can actually add carbon dioxide to your blood as a waste product, make the blood more acidic, and it frees up more oxygen for your tissues. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So now, why do we worry clinically if somebody is, if their blood pH is too acidic? Because they can't oxygenate themselves. Because you can't add carbon dioxide. I mean, you can't add oxygen to hemoglobin. Okay. So where do I get? Where do I release carbon dioxide from my blood? In my lungs. So this is an example of an external respiratory. That's in my lungs. And what am I going to do in my lungs? I'm going to make my blood more basic. Now, how does that benefit me? How does making my blood more basic benefit me? Well, look at the curve. It allows me to attach, attach more oxygen to my hemoglobin. Now, isn't that just darn cool? We can use a waste product from mitochondria, make our blood more acidic in our tissues, allow us to oxygenate our cells better. We can use our lungs to dissipate that carbon dioxide from our body and make our blood more basic and allow us to add more oxygen to our blood. And that's so cool, yeah. So, so blood pH becomes critical in a clinical setting. So what if your blood became really too basic? I mean, this says 7.6, which would be pretty bad. Let's say your blood became 8 for some reason. Then you can oxygenate your blood like crazy. You do blood oxygen levels, and your, your blood would be 100% oxygenated. But you can't get it off the hemoglobin. So it doesn't do you any good to have oxygen bound to hemoglobin if you cannot make it come uh, off. So you can have like all the oxygen you want in your blood and your brain would be starving for oxygen. So the more basic your blood pH becomes, that's what happens. Is it's just harder and harder to get the oxygen off the blood. So we use a shift in blood pH toward acidic, more acidic, to free oxygen off the hemoglobin. And then we use a slight shift in blood pH to slightly more basic to allow us to attach more oxygen to and in outside parameters, you get into serious trouble uh, clinically because of that. Right. So this is just the same equation I had over there. So this is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Well, the two graphs are identical. If you overlay those two graphs with one another, they are identical graphs. Why? Because the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood is what drives blood pH. So the two graphs become equal. And it's just the exact same thing. Where do we add carbon dioxide to our blood, at our tissues? Do we want a do we want a saturation curve that would be higher there, or a saturation curve that would be lower? Or do we want to saturate our blood at our tissues, or do we want to desaturate our blood at our tissues? We want to do what? We want to desaturate at our tissues, right? So, so. We add carbon dioxide to our blood and our tissues so that we have a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. When blood goes to our lungs, we breathe the carbon dioxide out. So that results in a low blood carbon dioxide. The blue line tells us we're adding more oxygen to our hemoglobin. The red line is telling us we don't have as much oxygen attached to our hemoglobin. So in our tissues, we want to take oxygen off the hemoglobin. And our, in our lungs, we want to add oxygen to the hemoglobin. So the perfect curve is again. And those are identical. Really cool. So now let's look at body, let's look at uh, blood temperature. So, so I always like this graph because it's like the, the ultimate extreme because if your temperature was 110, the least of your worries at that point would be percent saturation of hemoglobin. And you'd most likely be dead. Because all your enzymes go cuckoo. <laughs> and your body temperature could not reach 68 degrees, and, it's, it's, and you'd still be alive. So, 
these are the extremes. Okay. So what's the, what happens if blood is warmer? What happens? Does it give up this oxygen or does it attach oxygen to the hemoglobin? So you're looking at a saturation curve, right? So is this more saturated or is this more saturated? The blue one is more saturated. So as you warm your blood, it becomes less saturated. So when I would, between between spring and summer quarter, I took my, my mother to Kansas for a family thing. It was 104 one day, and the heat index was 118. And if you went outside, all you wanted to do was why? Because you can't oxygenate yourself. Because the air is so hot, it warms the the blood in your lungs, and you end up doing this. Yeah. So now let's think about a body. So we use our cardiovascular system and we use the skin primarily to, to dissipate heat. And we know that. If we hold someone's hand, your hands get warm and they're hot, yeah, because you're sharing that dissipated heat. So we use our cardiovascular system to get rid of heat. And we just said that if you feel your breath, the breath is warmer than the ambient air in the room because you're dissipating heat, right? So you're actually cooling your blood in your lungs. Now where did the heat come from that you are releasing from when, when your blood is in your lungs? What if you're walking up a set of stairs? It's coming from the skeletal muscle, right? So at our, at our tissues, we warm our blood. And in our lungs, we cool our blood. Okay, now we could we can now think of that in terms of internal respiration and external respiration, right? So during internal respiration we do we heat or cool it? We warm it, yeah. And then during ex external respiration, which would be going on in our lungs, we cool our blood. And what's the advantage? Well if we cool our blood then we can add more hydrogen, we can add more oxygen to it. If we warm our blood, we can't hold on to the oxygen as well. So again, we're using a shift in blood pH to help us exchange oxygen. Now, what's pretty fascinating is that if you were, if you decided you wanted to go kayaking in January on Lake Court Lane, and you flipped your kayak, then you land in Lake Coeur d'Alene in January, what's going to happen to your blood temperature? Is it going to heat or cool quickly? It's going to cool, man. So you guys don't, if you guys don't know that, every January the, the polar bear clubs splash in Coeur d'Alene. And people put their swimsuits on and jump in Lake Coeur d'Alene in January. And what happens is, if you did their percent saturation of the blood, it would be like 100%. But they would be dying. Because you can't give the oxygen off. Because you can't warm it enough in your tissues. So when you get into hyper, hypothermia, you know, where, where your body temperature is getting colder and colder and colder, you can oxygenate your blood like crazy in your lungs, but you cannot oxygenate your tissues because you can't give it off. Because what do you have to do to usually give it up? You have to warm your blood in your tissues. Right? All right, so here's a cool one. I always, I always thought this was fascinating. Yeah. So can't you just have really cold blood but a really high pH and have it balance it out? Or Well, you could. Okay. I mean, the two would, would work together. And it would actually begin to happen, but probably not at a fast enough rate. Yeah. So one thing to think about is, if you've ever known somebody who's gone through open heart surgery, it's usually a, a complicated surgery, even with these disciplines. And usually you're under anesthesia for a long time. When you're under anesthesia, your heart rate's really low. And almost everybody I've known that has had 
open heart surgery cognitively has lost capacity to to uh, remember to remember things, and they have some decline in their cognitive abilities, it, and it's because of a lack of O2 to the brain because you're just not oxygenating your brain well while you're in under anesthesia. So if we can cool the body, then we can decrease that complication. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So this one I always thought was cool. So fetal hemoglobin when baby is inside mom is different than adult hemoglobin. So when you were in your mom, you made a unique hemoglobin, which you only make during that period of your life when you're inside the mom. And the reason is, is because it has a higher affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin. So see, the fetal hemoglobin is slightly higher on the graph. And that assures that all things equal, baby's going to take mom's oxygen because fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity. So you ask yourself, how does baby oxygenate itself inside of mom when it can't breathe air? And now you know the answer. You have a unique hemoglobin that just deals with mom's hemoglobin. So what's cool about that, if you've, if you've been pregnant, known people that have been pregnant and you thought about it, is when mom's really active, baby is sleeping. I say toward the end of the pregnancy. Which is why you usually pull cakes at night when you're in bed. Exactly, because mom's using all the oxygen, so baby's brain is just going to go, okay, I'm tired, I'm not giving enough oxygen. So then mom lays in bed and tries to go to sleep. She doesn't use as much oxygen. And baby says, oh, wow, I got all this oxygen. Whoa, cool. Oh, oh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's just a simple thing that the fetal hemoglobin is going to take oxygen from mom and blood because it's got a higher affinity. All right. So, how does baby get rid of its carbon dioxide? Is this doing cellular respiration inside mom? Mom's lungs. Puts the carbon dioxide in mom's blood. So the mom's lungs have to take care of it. Ah. So at the placenta, if baby is giving off carbon dioxide to mom, then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in baby's blood at the placenta is dropping, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in mom's blood is elevating, right? So that's, that's the way we work. It's a capillary bit. That's the exchange. So as, as baby's partial pressure of carbon dioxide drops because it's given it to mom, it allows baby to take on more oxygen. Since baby's dumping all the carbon dioxide in mom's blood, her blood carbon dioxide level is elevating, and the oxygen's more willing to come off her immediately. Isn't that cool? So baby's creating this in mom, and this in itself. And it facilitates exchange. Okay. So if we understand that and we understand this equation, then in which instance, in low partial pressure of carbon dioxide or high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, is the blood becoming more acidic? So remember over here. If I add carbon dioxide to my blood, my blood becomes more acidic. So what's going on at the placenta is baby's blood is becoming more basic. So baby's essentially doing a strong respiration. And mom's blood is becoming more acidic. Right? Because of the carbon dioxide. Well, look what happens. As blood, mom's blood becomes more acidic, oxygen wants to come off mom's hemoglobin. As baby's blood is becoming more basic, it's wanting to attract more hemoglobin. So that helps baby take mom's oxygen. All right, so baby's metabolically active, so baby's building heat. How does baby dissipate its heat? 
Thumbs it in. Mom's blood. It says, here, Mom, <laughs> take care of this heat. So now what I thought was cool is, is, is my wife was always cold in the wintertime until she went through menopause. Now she's gone. And the only time she wasn't was when she was pregnant. Why? Because baby was eating her all the time. Okay, so think about that. How does baby cool his blood? Transfers heat to mom. So mom's blood is going to be warmed at the placenta. Baby's blood is going to be cool, right? So what was the effect of temperature? The higher the temperature, the lower the percent saturation of oxygen. So as baby transfers heat to mom's blood and mom's blood warms up, oxygen comes loose and hemoglobin more readily. The baby's blood is getting cooler. So the oxygen will be attracted to baby's hemoglobin more quickly. In fact, you know, all three of those things work in us between internal expiration and external respiration. And they're fundamentally important to mom being able to transfer oxygen to me. So, so the higher body temperature, the lower the saturation ability of O2, which yeah. means there's less O2. Yeah, right? on your hemoglobin, right. So that's why it's really hot to you want to sleep. Because you can't oxygenate yourself. So that's why pregnant women are supposed to get in hot tubs, into dry heat saunas. Why? Because as their body temperature goes up, the amount of oxygen to baby goes down. Yeah. 